Thank you for having me speak as part of Aspen's Malnutrition Week on this topic of neonatal transition from parenteral to enteral nutrition. My disclosures are listed here. I'm a member of the Speakers Bureau for Abbott Nutrition and Prolacta Bioscience, as well as Beef Love and Texans and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association because of my research on iron and zinc. I'm also a member of an advisory council, the Prolacta Bioscience Nutrition Advisory Committee, and I have sponsored research with Fresenius Cobby for a study that we're doing on SMOF. Transitioning from TPN to enteral feeds is a quite common occurrence for premature infants. However, it does have challenges. We must consider how to meet the infant's nutrient needs throughout the transition in order to support growth. You need to adjust the TPN concentration as feeds advance, as well as adjust feeds based on the new weight so that the baby doesn't outgrow their feeding orders. A few specific diseases also complicate weaning off to TPN. For example, cardiac and respiratory disease both limit the fluid volume that's tolerated by the baby. This can make advancement of enteral volumes difficult. GI disorders such as gastroschisis, emphalocele, and intestinal perforation can limit enteral feeding advancement as well due to gut immaturity, intolerance, and malabsorption. Here's some general guidance on transitioning from parenteral nutrition to enteral nutrition. For premature infants and uh, term infants on TPN, we generally stop the lipids when the feeds have reached about 80 mLs per kg per day. At this amount, the enteral feeds are providing enough fat to support the infant's needs. The next step usually occurs the following day when feeds are advanced to about 100 mLs per kg, and at that point, TPN can be stopped. The exception for this is infants with intestinal failure who you anticipate won't actually reach full feeds and will need to be on TPM for longer. We prefer to give feeds as bolus feeds over every three hours. We know that about 40% of the fat in human milk can be adhered to the tubing and doesn't actually reach the baby for that uh, nutrient or for those calories. So for that reason, we prefer not to give continuous feeds of human milk unless the baby has severe in feeding intolerance and can only tolerate continuous feeds. And finally, use fresh human milk whenever it's available. Here's a sample feeding guideline for babies less than 750 grams birth weight. Trophic feeds and TPN and lipids are started on day of life one. For babies this size, consider trophic feeds for about five to six days. You can see the feeding volume of 15 to 20 mLs per kg per day up until about five days. Slightly bigger babies of about 750 to 1250 grams birth weight would have their own feeding guideline pathway and they could be advanced slightly faster after about three to four days of trophic feeds. TPN decreases as enteral feeds decrease, TPN decreases as enteral feeds increase, but our lipids remain the same at the maximum of 15 mLs per kg per day. With this sample protocol, we started human milk-based, human milk fortifier at 60 mLs per kg per day using a plus six solution six calories per ounce added to the breast milk, assuming 20 calories per ounce, being able to provide 26 calories per ounce. Continuing on with the second week of life, feeds continue to be advanced. Again, lipids are DC'd when feeds reached 100, sorry, at 80, and TPN DC'd when feeds reached 100. We continue to increase the concentration and volume of the enteral feeds during the second week of life so that we reach full feeds by about day of life 12 if using the donor human milk-based human milk fortifier or day of life 13 if using the bovine HMF. The donor human milk-based HMF allows for more enteral support earlier before TPN is weaned. Adjusted feeding schedules broken down by birth weight status. You can see here various initiation rates of trophic feedings, when to advance those feeds, and how much to increase feeds. Of course, we're more conservative with the smallest babies. 
and I'd like to present this case study to you of a 25 and 6 7th weaker, a female born January, 20, January 4th, 2019, with chronic lung disease, later diagnosed with BPD, and also retinopathy of prematurity. At birth, her weight was 840 grams, had circumference of 23 centimeters, and length of 33 centimeters. She was started on TPN, intralipids, and trophic feeds on day of life one, and advanced appropriately. About two weeks later, around 28 weeks postmenstrual age, she had reached full feeds, TPN and intralipid had been weaned, and the human milk was fortified to plus eight with a donor human milk-based human milk fortifier at 160 ml per kg per day. A couple of weeks after that, at 30 weeks postmenstrual age, she had an intestinal perforation requiring XLAP for hernia repair, was found to have an incarcerated hernia, 25 centimeters of ileum was removed, an ileostomy was placed, and she began TPN and omegavin as the lipid choice because it was anticipated that she would require more long-term parenteral support, and we were worried about uh, cholestasis. After which time, buccal swabs of human milk were begun, and then we started advancing her enteral feeds. By about two weeks after that, she had reached full enteral feeds, almost back to her full uh, concentration and volume. At this point, she was taking human milk fortified to 26 calories per ounce and 150 ml per kg, and the omegavin and TPN were DC'd. A couple of weeks later, around uh, 35 weeks postmenstrual age, and I've marked it as well on the growth chart, she was noted to have increased stool output. At this point, um, because of this malabsorption, we switched her to plain human milk at 100 ml per kg and restarted TPN at 70. This continued uh, for another week until we started to increase the volume and concentration of her enteral feeds. At 38 weeks postmenstrual age, she was back to full feeds of fortified human milk, and we took her off the TPN. Then a couple of weeks after that, uh, it was time for the reanastomosis. So that was another significant event in her medical history. She was again back on TPN and made NPO for, uh, for bowel rest. Two weeks after the reanastomosis, around 43 weeks, we restarted her enteral feeds and again began advancing concentration, of, uh, concentration and volume of her enteral feeds while weaning off of the TPN. By about 50 weeks postmenstrual age, uh, she, there was no longer any uh, mother's milk available and she had outgrown our donor human milk policy. So she'd gone through several different formula changes because of her significant malabsorption still related to the, the initial perforation. And she had an NJ tube for continuous feeds of the formula at this point. We anticipate that she'll require a G tube prior to discharge. So as you can see, even an otherwise healthy infant who is successfully weaned off of TPN uh, the first time may develop intestinal issues that require additional TPN support once again. And it can be a challenge to meet growth needs of weight length and head circumference throughout hospitalization. As you can see by looking at our growth curves here, she went from about the 50th percentile in weight length and head circumference to about um, the third or less than the third percentile for, uh, for these growth parameters. Unfortunately, this is still a fairly common occurrence, especially among small premature infants, uh, where uh, some reports say uh, about 40 to 50 percent, other reports say even up to almost 100 percent of uh, small premature infants go home less than the third percentile. Thank you for your attention today. I've included my references here. First, the Coletsko book, uh, Nutritional Care of Preterm Infants, and then also the NICU guidelines, the guidelines for acute care of the neonate from Baylor College of Medicine. I'd also like to thank Fresenius Kabi for making this program available. And finally, thank you to Aspen for addressing these nutritional concerns for our smallest infants.